Great. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the BCI Society's third and final industry academia seminar of the year. Uh, my name is Yahya Ali, and I'll be moderating the event. And I am fortunate to be joined by Dr. Jennifer Collinger, who will give a talk about her work in academia, and Dr. Matt Engel, who will give a talk about his work in industry. So we'll start with Dr. Collinger's talk um, and then have Dr. Engel's talk right after that. So um, Dr. Collinger, if you want to pull up your slides, I will do a brief introduction um, while you're doing that. So Dr. Collinger is an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation at the University of Pittsburgh with secondary appointments in the Department of Biomed Bioengineering at the University of Pittsburgh and the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Collinger's research interests are related to the use of neuroprosthetics to restore function for individuals with upper limb paralysis or loss. Specifically, her research team is developing intracortical brain computer interface technology for individuals with tetraplegia. Her work also includes non-invasive imaging for measuring neuroplasticity after spinal cord injury or amputation. And she is currently the president of the International Brain Computer Interface Society. All right, without further ado, we'll go into Dr. Collinger's talk. Cool. Thanks for the introduction. Are my slides showing up okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, I'm really happy to be here and be part of this BCI Thursday series, um, which is a really exciting initiative that our postdoc and student committee has been running. Um, so excited to, to tell you a little bit about the role of an academic lab and, you know, told through the lens of my lab specifically um, in clinical translation of BCI technology. So um, just a couple notes about um, funding and industry collaborations. I don't have any personal financial um, conflicts of interest to disclose, but our lab does receive research funding from BlackRock Neurotech, and um, I'll be talking a little bit about some of that work today. Um, I also have um, collaborations with industry through NIH-funded awards. I'm a co-investigator on an award with Synchron um, that is developing an intravascular uh, BCI electrode technology, and also working with Ripple that is developing an implanted uh, EMG system for prosthetic control. So, um, you know, there's us in, in academia, and, you know, um, one of our major goals in developing this technology is to try to help see it through to clinical translation, right? And industry is really responsible for doing that, but how can we play a role? You know, one way, um, maybe on the engineering side, and this is not something that our lab has done, but, but many people have really innovated on the hardware side or engineering side. So electrodes, electronics, um, a lot of that technology, the, the early development can happen in academia and then be translated out to industry for further refinement and um, human translation. As we move towards clinical trials, we need to have a good understanding, you know, how we're going to use these devices. And so that's where, again, in academia, people are doing basic science studies um, to understand, for example, the neural basis of motor control or sensation. Um, we might need to do clinical trials to understand people's um, desires related to the development of these devices, how they might be used, how people behave sort of with able-bodied um, performance so that we can compare that to BCI performance. Another way that academia can be involved is by leading these early stage, early feasibility clinical trials. Um, so particularly for the Utah Array, for example, that I'll be talking about today, those early clinical trials are really being led um, by investigators at academic institutions um, to collect that early safety data, start to establish initial efficacy, and then inform larger clinical trials later on. You know, and really at any stage um, of the um, device development, there's opportunities to collaborate between industry and academia. So I'll talk at the very end of my talk a little bit about how we've worked with BlackRock to develop a more portable version of their neural signal processor that was motivated by, you know, our participants' desires to use the device in their home. Um, it allows us to do you know, new and interesting science and, of course, is relevant uh, to their goals of clinical translation. And then finally, you know, as the devices move closer to clinical translation, um, they're going to be studied under industry-led feasibility or pivotal trials. And you know, similar to um, the, the work being led by Synchron right now, they're working with academic institutions to, to conduct these feasibility trials and be involved uh, on that side. So now getting into our specific experience with developing BCIs, um, 
you know, medical technology should be motivated by clinical need. Most people are probably familiar with this study by Kim Anderson from 2004, where she asked people with tetraplegia, which of these eight different functions are their top priority for functional recovery? And for people with tetraplegia, restoration of arm and hand function was the most important by far. And so you know, our group and others think that brain computer interfaces might be a way to tap into that brain activity that it still remains intact after spinal cord injury, bridge the injured spinal cord and restore movement. You know, but a BCI could be many things. And so for us, um, we feel that we need to use an implanted system so that we have access to the level of information that we need about motor intention, um, as well as the potential to restore sensation for someone with spinal cord injury, which we think is critical for being able to restore dexterous uh, movements of the hand. So the device that we're using is a sensory motor BCI. This figure kind of highlights the major components we have intracortical microelectrode arrays implanted in motor cortex. We can record activity from those arrays, decode it, and turn it into a control signal for something like a robotic arm, a computer cursor. Um, other research groups are connecting it to um, implanted muscle or nerve stimulators to restore movement to a person's own limb. Um, in our case, we record from sensors in the robot, and we can turn that into stimulation patterns that we can play through electrodes in somatosensory cortex, shown here in red, with the goal again of trying to restore that sense of touch. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the pathway of how we got to that first in human clinical trial and what the role of academia was versus industry. So um, the overall goal of the study is to complete a first in human study that demonstrates the long-term safety and efficacy of a sensory motor BCI. Um, this work has been conducted under FDA investigational device exemptions led by the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Mike Boninger is the sponsor investigator. And our first study involved participant P1 um, at the University of Pittsburgh. That was really focused just on the motor control side. So first, rather than introducing the entire complex system, we wanted to show that we could, in fact, decode these signals and use them to control um, complex movements of the arm and hand. And the next three participants, P2 and P3 at the University of Pittsburgh, as well as C1 at the University of Chicago, um, all had the, the bi-directional or sensory motor BCI where we were recording um, for motor cortex and stimulating in somatosensory cortex. And I should just mention that our trial is now a multi-site trial um, with the Chicago site being led by Slima Bensmaya, Nico Hatsopoulos, and John Downey. The devices that we are using are the intracortical um, electrode arrays manufactured and marketed by BlackRock Neurotech. Now, these devices are cleared from the FDA um, with a 5 to 10K approval for temporary recording and monitoring of electrical brain activity. So FDA defines temporary as being for less than 30 days. So you need to request permission and put together an investigational device exemption to go outside of that approval. Um, one of the things that we can do is rely on reviewing prior research. So that could be animal studies that have shown the safety or efficacy of these devices at the time that we started our um, motor BCI study, there had already been um, chronic human implants as part of the brain gate trials being led at, at Brown University. Um, so we could rely on those published reports as well to support safety. Something that we wanted to do was implant two micro um, electrode arrays, whereas previous studies had only done one. So we needed to collaborate with industry to do all of the bench and validation testing that needed to go into supporting that. Examples include sterilization and packaging uh, testing, for example, that needed to be included. And so we worked closely with BlackRock in order to be able to submit um, that investigational device exemption. And I, I won't talk to you about sort of the science of this, um, but again, you know, this work was really grounded on decades of basic science work. Here, this is our participant. We're decoding um, in real time, simultaneous control of seven degrees of freedom of this robot. So 3D endpoint translation, 3D orientation, and then opening and closing the hand. And you can see she's able to put the object on the shelf, kind of visualize what it would take to bring the hand around the shelf without damaging the robot and place the object um, back on the table. And so just by kind of thinking about um, performing these movements, we're able to decode simultaneous and continuous control of all of these degrees of freedom, in addition to the safety data that we were able to collect in this trial. So the next step was then to move on to trying to add sensory feedback and this was the first time that this had ever been done in humans. And so we needed to do preclinical experiments to support um, and justify that first in human trial. Um, I'll talk about two of those experiments today. 
So the first um, was led by Sleeman Ben Smaya at the University of Chicago and Rob Gaunt at the University of Pittsburgh. And they worked with FDA to design um, a good laboratory practice controlled non-human primate study. And so the study basically consisted of six, uh, six months of stimulation where it was done five days per week, four hours per day using well-controlled parameters in three different animals. Um, the outcomes were to assess behavior during the experiment and then to do an examination of the tissue at the end of the experiment. As a brief overview of the methods, we had two electrode arrays implanted in somatosensory cortex. Um, we're delivering stimulation using biphasic pulses. This is just a um, spatial map and out, uh, um, spatial map of the array itself. And each of these different colors represent different stimulation parameters because we kind of wanted to um, examine a range of different parameters that we expected to use in the human study. And the outcome here um, was to do the histological assessment. So you can see in these histology slides, obviously where the electrodes actually penetrated the tissue, there's no neurons, there's damage there. Um, but what we were really interested in characterizing was the density of neurons around that area. And so this plot is showing as you increase distance away from the, the center of that point, what's the ratio of, of neurons in that tissue for control tissue in blue with no stimulation and stimulated tissue in red. You can see that there's really not any differences. Um, if anything, the neuron density was a little higher in the stimulation conditions. So the outcome of this trial um, was that while the implantation and residence of the arrays in the cortical tissue did cause significant damage, right, this part right here, Chronic ICMS had no detectable additional effect. And furthermore, the animals had no impairments in fine motor control. So this went a long way towards establishing the safety of the parameters that we were proposing. The next experiment was to actually try to put together this full recording and stimulation setup um, so that we can make sure that it was ready to go and working in our human experiments. And this work was led by Rob Gaunt again at the University of Pittsburgh in collaboration with Andy Schwartz in his uh, monkey lab. So in this study, we had arrays implanted in both motor cortex and somatosensory cortex. These figures here are just showing that um, on each of these electrodes, you can record activity while you stimulate the monkey's hand or face. And we see activity that spans kind of that hand and face representation across these two electrode arrays. Um, we, as part of this study, put together the actual recording and stimulation hardware and software that was used in our human trials and could demonstrate the functionality of it. So you have this implanted um, array system here that connects through a patient cable um, out to uh, an amplifier and digitizer, a neural signal processor to, you know, to process those signals. Um, it sends it out to our computer where we can decode that activity and control an external device. On the sensory pathway, we're recording activity from sensors in the robots, um, sending that back into the stimulator to deliver stimulation pulses and through the patient cables. And so with this study, there were a number of lessons learned. Um, some of the most important being that, number one, our neurosurgeon who did the human implants had practice using these multi-array devices. So typically there had only been one array connected to one pedestal, and um, we needed to manage two arrays connected to one pedestal. Um, and so this gave her practice with doing that. We were able to demonstrate that we could deliver closed loop stimulation based on force data from the robots and also implement um, stimulus artifact rejection. So whenever you stimulate in the brain, it introduces artifact into your recordings, which can contaminate your ability to decode. And so we needed to figure out how to deal with that in real time. Um, also importantly, there were no stimulation related adverse events in this study. So as we move to human implant, we needed to figure out where to place those arrays. Um, so in a, a monkey brain, the hand representation is pretty small and you could cover the entire thing with these two arrays. In a human, it's much bigger. So if you kind of focus your attention on the left, this is a zoomed in view of an MRI with the central sulcus shown here. And this where with all the colors is somatosensory cortex. And so we had a person with spinal cord injury um, in a magnetoencephalography machine, watching videos of someone having their thumb, index and little finger and palm touched and they sort of imagined what those sensations would feel like um, since they had no sensation themselves. And so based on these maps that we got, um, we decided to place our arrays to try to span this thumb and index finger area 
and then hopefully the, the index through little finger representations with this array. You kind of zoom out and look at those maps just a little bit bigger so that you can see what's going on. Now these colors are representing what happens when you stimulate through this electrode, where does it generate a sensation? And so you can see this lateral array is generating sensations more on the index finger. As you move more medial, you start to get into the middle and ring finger, and then most medial is the pinky finger. So this matches up with what we saw on the pre-surgical planning. It demonstrates you know, that a person with spinal cord injury could feel sensations that felt like they were coming from their own hand, which is something that we could never have known um, just from the animal studies alone. And we've now had a chance to do this in three participants. Um, this work is being led by Charlene Flesher and Taylor Hobbs at the University of Pittsburgh and Charles Greenspan at University of uh, Chicago. So this map is essentially showing um, for one day where we go through and stimulate all of the electrodes in random order, where are all of the sensations that are generated? And so for participant P2, whose data was shown on the last slide, you can see he gets sensations that span the hand, mostly at the base of the fingers. For participant P3, you can see that there's sensations again across all of the digits, sometimes moving a little bit further up towards the fingertips. And then for participant C1 in Chicago, we get good coverage of the first four fingers, um, and again, mostly on the fingertips in this participant. So there are still some differences um, related to the array placement and the types of sensations that are generated. I mentioned that a key goal of these studies is to quantify safety. You could imagine that stimulating on these electrodes repeatedly could potentially damage the electrodes themselves um, or the surrounding tissue. What this graph is showing is the number of electrodes that were responsive, the generated sensations um, that the person could perceive over time. And so across the bottom here is days after implant. If you look at this green curve, this is participant P2. He's now been implanted for over 2,500 days, or, you know, seven years essentially. And the number of electrodes that evoked a sensation actually increased all the way out until two years after implant and has remained fairly stable for the rest of that implant time. Um, participant P3 has been implanted for about two years and again saw that increase in the number of responsive electrodes. Um, participant C1 in Chicago has had nearly all of their electrodes generate sensations um, since kind of the beginning of the study. Uh, one of the major efficacy outcomes was to show that sensory feedback could improve motor performance. That was something we wanted to, to find out if that was true. And I won't really um, have time to get into the results here, but I'll show you a, a video of that performance. And so the, for the experiment, we were recording activity again from motor uh, cortex, decoding a 5D control signal this time. So 3D translation, pronation and supination of the wrist, opening and closing the hands. For the sensory feedback, we were recording data from the torque sensors in the robot and stimulating a corresponding channel with sort of an increasing amplitude of stimulation as the torque increased on that finger. And this video um, will show you a comparison of the fastest trials on the action research arm test. This is an assessment of upper limb function on the left with stimulation, on the right without stimulation. And so what you'll see is that for every different object, um, across all days, they were always faster with stimulation. And in fact, even for this task where he was very well practiced on it, had used it for, had done it for two years prior to these experiments, um, we were able to cut the completion time in half from about 20 seconds to 10 seconds on average. If you look at the without stimulation trials, you can kind of see that the area where they're having difficulty is in knowing that the hand is securely grasping the object and then being confident in picking it up that they're not gonna drop it. And so, you know, we feel like the stimulation that was provided is essentially conveying the same type of information as cutaneous feedback does naturally. And I'll wrap up here by again, just giving you another um, idea of how we've collaborated with industry. You know, we're really interested in trying to get this technology out of the lab and into the home. And so you can see from this setup, it's complicated, right? What we use in the lab. We've got five computers, we've got rack mounted neural signal processors, amplifiers, power supplies, multiple displays. This is not a practical in home system. Um, so, as part of a, a DARPA funded project, one of the engineers in the lab, Jeff Weiss, worked with uh, the BlackRock team uh, to kind of test and validate this portable version of a neural. Uh, of the neural signal processor. So all of the computers are replaced by this medical grade tablet. 
all of the ample, all of the um, neural signal processors are replaced by this wearable NSP hub. And the amplifiers are actually replaced in this uh, head stage here that digitizes the, the signal. So these white boxes are not even really part of the system. They're just the um, signal simulators. So already you can tell this is much, much smaller than what we had in the lab. Um, this is a, an image of our participant using it. Um, so we've got it mounted to a stand where he can see it on his wheelchair. He's got the digital head stages attached and he's able to use it you know, outside of the lab environment. Um, I'd encourage you to check out Brian DeCleva's paper um, where we've presented on a new way to decode both the, the reach, but mostly the click signal um, so that we can enable reliable both click and click and drag features. And to give you an idea um, of what this looks like, I'll show you a video of him playing solitaire using this decoder. And so this is completely under brain control. He's controlling the 2D movement of the cursor as well as the click and, and drag feature. And so this is a version of solitaire I had never heard of, but apparently it's very similar, except that there's, I think, six decks of cards. And you can see that he's able to pick up the pile of cards that he wants, drag them to the right spot um, pretty precisely without dropping them. Um, so starting to get to the point where this is um, something fun and useful that they can use. So with that, I'll just say, you know, hopefully I've shown you a few different ways that academia can, can play a critical role in translation of these devices. One thing that's maybe different about academia is, you know, one of our major drivers is to disseminate and publish these results um, so that hopefully as everybody is working on their piece of the puzzle, right, we can kind of bring that all together into a final device. And at the same time, even though, you know, I showed you some videos that I think are, are pretty neat. Um, current BCIs are far from perfect. And so I think we still need to work together to advance the science and engineering that are needed to build kind of the, the ideal device. But at the same time, the devices that we have might be appropriate for translating now um, to provide medical benefit to people. So I'd encourage us to think about that. And with that, I'll just thank our team um, and of course the study participants who are extremely dedicated to this work. We could not do it without them. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that uh, incredible talk, Dr. Collinger. Um, we will go back and uh, go through the, the questions at the end after Dr. Engel's talk. Um, so uh, Dr. Engel, while you're pulling up your slides, I will give an introduction. So Matt Engel is the founder and CEO of Paradromics. He has a technical background in the design of neural recording systems, and he's an active advocate for the use of neural technology as medicine. Dr. Engel completed his PhD in neuroscience at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research at the University of Heidelberg. Prior to founding Paradromics in 2015, Dr. Engel conducted postdoctoral research in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Stanford University focused on next-gen electronics for large-scale neural recordings. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Engel, and whenever you're ready, feel free to start. Um, I think you're muted. There we go. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, thank you, Dr. Collinger, for that. Uh, um, that was like a, a great introduction for what I wanted to talk about on my first slide, which is that in my view, um, your lab and other labs doing translational BCI work have beat a path now for devices, for real sort of real medical uh, to come uh, to the market and, 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 and start providing to patients. I think the hardest thing, the hardest thing to do in, in bringing kind of new therapies using sort of complex devices to market is to show that it can fundamentally work, to show that when the device is built, it can do something useful. That's the thing that um, is really hard to underwrite for industry, this kind of application, uh, this therapeutic risk. But once it's shown, uh, it opens the doors for private investment and kind of massive, uh, you know, engineering efforts uh, to come through and, and kind of and build new devices. So just to kind of um, 
double down on, on, on some of what you were saying. I have seen, you know, with the Utah Ray now, outcomes that I think we would, we would consider to be, uh, you know, beneficial for the participants in the study. So um, you highlighted this restoration of movement and touch. I think I would also want to talk a little bit about the restoration of communication that we've seen in different trials and most notably uh, Frank Willett and Krishna Shinoy's work at Stanford restoring uh, typing at a very proficient rate due using imagined handwriting and recordings from hand knob. These are things that have happened, you know, using the Utah Ray, which was essentially invented in the late eighties kind of perfected in the early nineties and has been the uh, backbone of BCI clinical translation for you know, two decades. We also can see that uh, devices are starting to be uh, considered and, and shown to be efficacious you know, in, in such, uh, such applications as mood disorders. You know, the neuropace device that was developed for epilepsy was used off-label by Eddie Chang's group as a way of treating depression. And so we're getting these really critical proof, proof of concepts that can allow us now to reach and invest engineering resources and do development to build products. And um, that's kind of where we come in, is that we can see that when we look at all of the amazing work that's been done with the Utah Ray, there are still, uh, as was pointed out, places where you could improve. Um, one of the things that we think could be would vastly improve brain computer interfaces would be if you didn't have to deal with any kind of transcutaneous wires or pedestals. If the entire system could be wireless, you know, both for BCI, but also for the kind of much more prevalent, let's say LVADs, left ventricular assist devices that are used uh, um, for the heart, you can see that whenever there's something coming through the skin, that that's a potential site of infection and it requires constant wound care to make a device completely wireless. Many of you know, that's, um, that's a big breakthrough. And I think, so first of all, just kind of being able to productize a system that um, is just a little bit better packaged for long-term everyday use would be a huge advantage. But we can also see that there would be advantages to having more data um, one of the things we've learned from the Utah Ray trials is that using more Utah Rays can result in better performance. And when you artificially downsample the number of channels that you're using from a Utah Ray, you can achieve, you, you get worse performance. Uh, the data rate is related to the number of electrodes that you have uh, in the brain and the number of signals that you can collect. So if you can build a system that supports higher data rate, that would be better. I want to just quick, I'll quickly talk about some of the things that we're doing, and then I want to, I want to get through the slides so that we can have some Q&A, but, um, you know, when we look at the Utah Ray, we see a number of things that could be uh, better. One of them is that the device is insulated with Paraline C, which uh, tends to be a source of sig uh, signal loss over the multi-year time frame. Paraline C is a thin biocompatible polymer. Uh, but when you leave it in for a long time, it starts to swell, it starts to crack, which means your insulation gets worse and your signal amplitudes decrease. If you replace the Perlin C with a ceramic coating, however, you can extend the lifetime of the device. Similarly, uh, silicon is not a very good electrode material, but if you replace the silicon with a metal like platinum iridium, um, you don't have the problem of the thin film metallization on the tip of the uh, silicon electrode coming off and resulting in uh, worse signal impedance and ultimately loss of signals. So those are just two uh, material upgrades you can make that, that have a, a good effect on uh, device longevity. Uh, of course, we talked about, um, uh, I talked about electrode count. Um, if you put 400 electrodes onto a single module, you have four times more data uh, to decode from. Of course, as you start scaling these structures up and you start trying to pack more and more electrodes onto dual, you run into the problem of multiplexing. Um, a passive array like the Utah array, uh, you need a wire for every electrode in the module, which means the cable starts to get quite bulky. But if you put an active ASIC in the device, then you can allow for multiplexing and you have a really flexible lead and just continue packing more and more channels on as the capability to manufacture denser electroarrays and feed-throughs uh, matures. 
We've also built a wireless power and data system. It is, you can see the form factor looks a lot like an implantable pulse generator like you'd have for DBS. It has inductive power and it has a VIXEL to transmit data through the skin um, using infrared light. It uh, clocks at about 100 megabits per second, and the system can deliver 500 milliwatts of continuous power. Um, so that makes it kind of state of the art for medical devices right now, especially the data rate. When we look at the, one of the really important things as a startup and in general in, in translation, not only clinical translation, but translation to a commercial product, is making sure that you have what you call in kind of startup land product market fit making sure that the first thing that you're going to do with the technology um, is a very clear uh, slam dunk from a kind of patient application and product standpoint. What we see based on all of the published work to date is that the one place where our BCI's capabilities have certainly exceeded the bar for being therapeutically useful is in the area of communication. Um, when we look at, for instance, cursor control, but also um, control of text, especially in the Willett study, we can see that for a patient with tetraplegia, um, we're now at the point where we can offer very useful interaction with the computer. Um, it's, it's, in my view, gone beyond just a kind of proof of concept study, and it's now at the point where we can do very useful things that could even reimbursement from CMS in, in some pretty significant amounts. In terms of data, one of the other things that we feel very strongly about building uh, things that can scale up to more and more data. Um, our system has a hub that allows us to use four cortical modules simultaneously. Uh, that means up to 1,600 channels in a single system. Um, you know, big picture where I see BCI right now is I think that it's a lot like modems and early internet. I mean. They're the things that you could do on the internet when you had a 56 kilobits per second modem, and they're the things that you do now. And a lot of the, a lot of the internet applications that, that we use all the time, like let's say like Netflix, Amazon Prime, um, streaming, high data rate video, it's not like those were genius applications where someone was like in the bathtub and they bonked their head and they said, let's do streaming high definition video and it changed the world. I mean, everyone knew that they wanted to do that for decades prior, even like James Bond in the 60s had like a little video watch that he could use. The thing was, is that the underlying hardware infrastructure didn't support it. Enough people didn't have enough bandwidth to do it. And so I think what, what we're about to see happening in, uh, in BCI and is that as these new architectures come out with more and more data capabilities, the things that you can use BCI for and the number of product market fits that, that, that you have will, will just start expanding very quickly. And the amount of money coming in will mean that the technology starts to improve faster and faster. And so I just wanted to leave with like a final thought with respect to data rate and, uh, and communication rate, you know, right now, we're in a situation where we have these this sort of imagined handwriting. We have speech decoding based on limited corpus of words. We have um, cursor control using BCI. And we're just now at the point where our technologies are exceeding the sort of least invasive uh, competitor technology, so to speak, which is gaze tracking. We're just now at the point where the technology is, is, uh, is marketable. But for instance, the device that Paradromics is building right now supports eight times higher data rate than was used in the Willett study. And certainly, you know, Neuralink, BlackRock, Paradromics, we're going to keep building better and better systems and keep pushing this. And so it's interesting to think what implication this could have just in the first uh, BCI application of, a, of assistive communication. Awesome. Thank you so much for that um, for that talk, Dr. Engel. Uh, yeah, it's really exciting to see this this field moving very quickly closer to therapeutic applications where we can actually see patients taking these devices home um, in the next few years. So um, pulling up the Q and A right now. Okay. 
Okay, so we have a question um, for, from Alexander in the Q&A. He says, hey, Matt, did your trip to DC generate any discussion with HHS regarding reimbursement pathways for BCI? Yeah, so I had um, the audacity to grab uh, Secretary Becerra kind of between talks, and um, I raised um, with him and, and, and one of his staff members that was there uh, something that I think is very important for all of us, which is um, the fate of breakthrough, uh, breakthrough devices and breakthrough designation um, with CMS. So in the previous administration, there was this contemplated rule for CMS that uh, breakthrough devices uh, as designated by the FDA would receive four years of reimbursement sort of out of the gate by CMS. And that was kind of put on pause now um, in the current administration and is under review and, and is likely to come back in some form, but I, and it's still, it's still an issue that is in flux. And so that's definitely a, a space for advocacy, um, you know, for all of us, because the, the nature of the kind of the final decision on this will either strongly encourage or, or um, be kind of neutral or sort of discouraging uh, for investment in the BCI space. As, as I don't know, many of you may not be familiar with the sort of how reimbursement happens for medical devices, but for new devices, um, they often need to get new codes and then they need to get new reimbursement decisions. And CMS doesn't engage with companies until after clinical approval. So it's not like uh, what you'd like to do is you'd like to be pipelining the reimbursement decision in parallel to your conversation with FDA and your, and your early feasibility and pivotal trials. But CMS essentially doesn't do that. They want to wait and, and only have the conversation about approved devices. But what that can result in is that C you're having these conversations and CMS is asking for more evidence. And then there's a period of uncertainty, you know, that could be two years after device approval, where you're, you're being very scrappy and trying to bill against different codes, um, trying to get things like new technology add-on payments. Um, and it can be it can be another play, another hurdle for uh, commercial traction. But but I think some of the rules that have been contemplated would actually really, really help by providing some certainty for med device companies. Absolutely. And I, I feel like once it's sort of someone has to do it first, right? And when, once that first BCI device gets um, the right code, um, it, it becomes easier for for others that are on, right? Yeah, I think and I think this is also a place for collaboration between companies. Um, you know, there's a way that everyone can be kind of like fighting each other in messaging, or there's a way that people can kind of get together and and, uh, and think collaboratively and constructively. And yeah. the I think the good thing is is that our field is so new that I think most of the most of the actors, most of the companies. Um, feel the latter, they feel collaborative and constructive. So I have, I have generally good feelings about where we're headed. Awesome, that's great to hear. The, the next question um, is for, for either speaker. Um, William asks, do you have any advice for undergraduates who are planning to pursue a career in the field of BCI slash neurotech? Sure. Uh, I guess I can, can go first. I mean, one thing, right, is that this is a really multidisciplinary field. And so I think as an undergraduate, you have a chance to still kind of explore all of those different areas to see maybe where you want to contribute. Because eventually, right, no one person is going to be an expert in the clinical aspects, the computational aspects, the engineering, right? Um, but you should be familiar with what all of those different things are. And so, you know, taking classes in, in neuroscience and statistics, programming, um, all of that will prepare you well. And then I would really just encourage you to jump in and you know, join a research lab or do an internship at a company, even if it's maybe not the exact thing that you think you want to do, right? See how you can play your part in that project and you kind of learn about what everybody else is doing so that you know maybe where you want to go for your next step. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Engel, do you have anything to add to that? Um, one thing that I have in the kind of industry 
uh, academia to industry transition, one thing that I have found um, in terms of the skill sets that we're often requiring, and um, and I think this is the same for a lot of my kind of um, peers on the kind of early stage startup side. As a postdoc or graduate student, you do it all and you need to know a little bit of everything. You need to be kind of a jack of all trades. But for early stage kind of resource startups, um, we're often looking for someone who is expert at one thing, um, who is very excellent at one thing. And then we're willing, if there's some extra stuff that they need to kind of train up in or some context that they need, we're willing to kind of help them get there. But generally a smart person can get you know, it's kind of 80-20. A smart person can get to sort of like dilettante level of understanding very quickly, um, but it's hard to become an expert in something. And, and it's often beyond the scope of training at a startup to make you an expert. And so, yeah, I would say that there's some value to being specialized and having specialized skills. Awesome. Okay, so the, the next talk, uh, the next uh, question uh, could be for either speaker. So Michael asks, if specifically for communication, do you see BCI eventually being just a plug and play system, like a keyboard or mouse with devices that are commercially available for communication? Or do you think it's better to have a self-contained system? So. Um, basically where, where your company or your um, uh, organization would make the entire system from, from end to end? Is that for either of us? It, yeah, I think it could be. Um, yeah. So do, do you want to go with your thoughts first? Sure. Yeah. I mean, this is actually kind of a debate as to what is the device, right? And does it need to go mm -hmm. from implant all the way to the, to the end? And, you know, um, I would say, at least from my side, from getting feedback from our study participants, right? Once they have this BCI, I think they see multiple opportunities to use it to improve their their function, right? It could be interfacing with environmental control units with their computer. You know, it, if it's truly specifically just for communication, right, and vocalization, maybe that could be a special device. But if you want to interface with your computer, I think people want to be able to take advantage of as much that is commercially available as possible, um, which introduces complexity into the regulatory pathway um, for these devices, because it needs to be shown to be safe and effective. There needs to be you know, standards or sort of criteria for interfacing with commercially available technology, even if it's a computer. Um, so it is more complex, but I, I think that's the way to go. Agree. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, the next question is, um, let's see. So Jimmy says, I'm curious as to what is the pathway within paradromics from initial preclinical validation studies to clinical studies? And what is the organizational structure of those respective teams? Kind of how are you going from preclinical to, to um, clinical studies? Yeah. Well, we have recently hired um, a VP of regulatory, Noah Barsh, and uh, a kind of clinic, uh, kind of head of clinical, uh, Ken Walker, who are, you know, industry, coming from industry and um, have a lot of experience with class three devices. Um, you know, from a personnel standpoint, we're, I mean, we're staffing up as a medical device company. Um, you know, I think my thoughts on preclinical in this context for the first market is that we know enough from early studies with the Utah array to know that if you can go into the right areas of motor cortex and record units, that you can map that activity onto useful functions. And so from our standpoint in a preclinical context leading into the early feasibility study, we really just need to show that we can record the signals um, that are you know, predictive of uh, the, the outcomes that we're looking for you know, in the various communication modalities, show that we can record those signals in large animal um, cortex 
and show that those signals can be recorded safely and that de the devices can, um, can last on time frames that are appropriate to justify an early feasibility study. Um, we don't see, we don't really see, you know, application oriented at kind of application endpoints in these uh, preclinical studies. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, sheep don't uh, don't speak, they don't type, and they they don't generally use mouse. And um, and we think that we're actually of the opinion that um, for these kinds of safety studies, that animals like sheep and pigs are are the most appropriate systems to use. Were um, I think there's been being recorded, so I'd be careful what I say. I think there's been a lot of great academic work in non-human primates, but most medical device companies that are building um, neuro devices don't work in non-human primates, and that's generally not not the system of choice for uh, for preclinical safety studies. Makes sense. Yeah. Um... So the, the next question is from uh, Sergei Stavisky. Uh, he says, first of all, fantastic talks uh, to both of you. And um, this is a question for Dr. Collinger and Dr. Engel can follow up. Um, so the current Utah arrays are restricted to the gyral surface. Do you think that's sufficient for restoring more natural sensation? Or do you need to get into deeper areas for functions like proprioception? And if so, uh, Dr. Engel, how much harder it is? How much harder is it to make arrays that go deeper, like ten millimeters? Um, yeah. Cool. I, I like how the question is separated. I just get to say what we want, and Matt can figure out how to make that happen. So that so that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think Sergey brings up a good point, right? We know a lot about the anatomy of both motor and somatosensory cortex. And right now we are decoding and stimulating just on the surface of the gyrus. Right? As you go into the central sulcus on the motor side, you start to get more um, corticomotor neurons that have direct connections down to the muscles. And so it's possible that for really dexterous control of the hand, that having electrodes on the um, that go deeper, even on the motor cortex side, that might be important for decoding, at least for, for hand movements in particular. On the sensory side, for sure, um, there are different functional areas within somatosensory cortex. And so the typically proprioceptive information comes into area 3A, which is right down in the, you know, sort of the deepest part of, of the sulcus. If we have any hope of restoring proprioception, I think we're going to have to stimulate in that area. Um, even for the sense of touch, we're stimulating right now in area one, which is an area that processes cutaneous inputs, but it's not the primary area. We would want to go a little bit down into the bank, um, into area 3B, potentially. So yes, Matt, could you make some longer electrodes for us? Yeah, I think it's not even just making the electrodes longer, but I think it's the, the Utah Ray form factor, which is the same kind of general design that we're using, is su very suitable for gyruses, not very suitable for sulci. Um, the dissection that you need to do to expose a surface for implantation, um, I, I'm not bullish about that. I think that probably the Michigan probe form factor is much more suitable for recording in a sulcus. I think what that means practically is being strategic about what applications you pursue and making, if you're using a Utah reform factor, choosing applications where you can deliver a therapeutic benefit, you know, you with kind of recording only from gyri. Okay, so a sulcus probe um, would be great. Uh, and the Michigan, the kind of the Michigan probe obviously has been used in a lot of different embodiments. Um, Neuralink has a kind of Michigan style thread that they're using. I think what I have not seen to date is I have not seen a Michigan style probe that has been made in a way, meaning made of materials uh, that I believe will last more than two years in the body. And that's because these Michigan probes are, tend to be made by thin film techniques. Um, the ones that are in vogue right now are these flexible, uh, flexible probes, these kind of threads, but they tend to be on polymeric substrates like polyamide. And these kinds of devices um, don't have great longevity. 
I think we could also say like one of the really, really exciting academic uh, devices that's being used right now is the NeuroPixel, but that's even harder because uh, that has active electronics in the shank itself and protecting active electronics using kind of thin film technology on the multi-year time frame is that is like a holy grail of microelectronic packaging for the body, but doesn't exist yet. And so, yeah, from, from my practical standpoint, I see a sulcus probe as something that we should build, other people should build, but since it doesn't exist right now, in terms of early stage BCI markets, we should focus on things that don't strictly require that. Yeah, and maybe just to kind of add on, you were saying, right, you should focus on trying to deliver functions that we can actually do, right, with, with the electrodes that we have and access to the gyrus. And so um, when you saw on my plots kind of where we're able to evoke sensations on the hand, right, we're covering something like 10% of the hand with the electrode arrays that we have. And so just even being able to provide broader spatial coverage of the gyrus, I think would probably be the next best step as opposed to trying to go into the sulcus, even though we would need to do that for um, proprioception. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, a related question actually from, from Anuj is, what is actually the greatest bottleneck in scaling up these implantable microelectrode array systems? Um, is it the manufacturing space? Is it the software pipeline, signal acquisition? I also add, is it the science? Um, what do you guys think? Uh, I'm gonna say that the hardware development is the, is the bottleneck <laughs> right now. Um, I mean, it's just tricky, right? Connectors, sort of building these devices that can stay long-term in the body, I think is the, the biggest challenge, right? Um, not that there's not work to be done about what to do with that data once you have it. Um, but yeah, it, it's really tricky, I, I think, building this hardware um, for more channels. It's easy to build really high channel count electronics. Um, like we built for our, our Argo system, which was not implantable. It was a 65,000 channel device and we put 30,000 microelectrodes on it. It's really easy to, a lot of people can build things like that. And there are a number of medical device companies that can build hermetically packaged devices that will last for 20 years in the body. But the intersection of companies that can build high channel count devices that are also hermetic and can live in the body for a very long time. Like it might be two companies, but I suspect it's just one. <laughs> Which company? Um, so I think that's, that's the, and, and I think like some of the, some of the things that limit us are boring, like mm -hmm. feed throughs like to make the next generation of our devices, we're probably going to have to make our own feed throughs. Like the, the state of the technology is, um, is, is, is kind of dismal. Um, but, but then the overarching thing is really capital. Um, there are a lot of things that can be done. There are a lot of places where we've looked and we've said, okay, the ecosystem, the vendors that support us, they are, um, they, 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 they're just not good enough, but there's no reason why it couldn't be built. Like it could absolutely be done. But then the question is like, what, what are investors willing to underwrite? Most investors want to get a product out as quickly as possible. Um, and there's not, there's, not necess, there's not always capital to like start underwriting the next big thing before you bring the first device to market. I think it'll be easier for subsequent companies that come along on the, on the heels of you know, several commercial successes. Um, but right now, still capital limited. Yeah, absolutely. The next question uh, is from Hunter. He asks, uh, Dr. Collinger, you show that stimulation to S1 improves neuroprosthetic motor control compared to when no stimulation is provided at all. Have you considered adding more controls here to help show what it is about the stimulation that is helpful? Is the stimulation helpful because it's specifically provided directly to cortex instead of say like a non-invasive um, tactile feedback on the neck? Or is it because the stimulation is provided in a finger specific manner 
instead of arbitrarily creating those uh, digit stimulation mappings? Yeah, it's it's a good question, um, you know, and we have thought about that and we are doing that for some of our experiments. One thing that I would say is um, we don't necessarily care about evaluating performance on a single task. What is the influence of sensory feedback on a, a single task, right? I think it's a more um, holistic view that sensory feedback is going to be important as your ability to control the, the motor side of the BCI improves. And so I, I think we are interested in doing those comparisons um, where maybe maybe it's possible, right, that um, using a, a vibrotactor could have provided that, that same um, benefit. But I think as you start to go towards more, more dexterous tasks where you need information about individual digits, right, that's certainly not going to scale. Um, the other thing that I would say is, you know, the performance improvements did come kind of during the same period of time as um, we would expect based on natural cutaneous feedback. And there was really no learning required, um, which is what people have shown in sensory substitution studies that you kind of need to learn. So mm -hmm. yes, I think we should do that for some of these more simple experiments. I think the, the vision, right, is that um, this is going to be critical as the task complexity increases. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and related to that, I was wondering, uh, Dr. Engel, do you plan to have support for stimulation in, in your um, paradromics device? Yes, the architecture supports stimulation, but the mm -hmm. initial device that we build won't be a stimulating device. It, it adds, in my opinion, unnecessary overhead um, in the regulatory process. And since mm -hmm. the communication device doesn't require it, that would be a, that would be a V2. But, in, but platinum meridian microelectrodes are great for intracortical stimulation. And the electronic design, we've, since we already done during the DARPA project that initially funded a lot of our electronic design work. Yeah. Awesome. So the, the next question is from Patrick. Uh, this question is for, for both speakers. What performance model, what, sorry, what performance benchmark performance benchmarks would need to be met for BCI-controlled robotic arm before such a system is deemed clinically viable? Yeah, um, I guess I could take that one and maybe my answer might be surprising is that I'm not sure that there is such a, a benchmark, right? We, we actually use the robot um, because it can reliably execute the, the movement commands so that we can really study how to get this information out of the brain. Yeah. For somebody with spinal cord injury, um, there have been a number of survey studies right, that have shown that people would much prefer to restore movement to their own limb than have a robotic arm assistant. Um, and so even if you could show that you know, this robotic arm could somehow increase the independence of a participant, um, I, you know, I don't know how big the market might be for something like that. People would rather you know, be able to use their, their own arms reanimated through you know, muscle or nerve or spinal cord stimulation. That in and of itself is a you know, very challenging problem that other research groups are working on. And so we're hoping to, to put those two things together. Um, now, I will say for somebody who has a very high level amputation or something like that, right, there's really no good way right now for people to control an entire you know, myoelectric arm and hand. And so in that particular case, I think that demonstrating that there's an improvement in, in independence using you know, standard clinical metrics um, would be viable. You know, maybe um, just given the time scales of the development of you know, muscle and nerve stimulation, people would accept a robotic arm, but I, I think that's going to be a much higher bar. I wouldn't be surprised if there were a decade where people voluntarily have their arms amputated to receive a robotic arm. Because if I just look at the state of functional electrical stimulation of the muscles, I mean, like the recruitment of muscle fibers is like a ballet, but like when you try to stimulate them from the outside, from the, I, I don't know, like, Man, you're, you're much closer to this than I am, but I, I feel like the BCI will outpace functional electrical stimulation to such a degree that there will be a period where 
robotic hands and arms can do amazing things, and FES is still like rudimentary level of control. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of progress and demonstrations with using FES to restore hand function, right? And there are still challenges with that muscle fatigue and sort of the complexity of movements that you can evoke. But when as soon as you start to think about trying to move an entire arm through FES, um, that is a really difficult challenge, just given sort of the physiology of, of, of muscle stimulation. Um, people are exploring other approaches like spinal cord stimulation to potentially get around that. Um, yeah, I don't know if we'll see that that trend in, in spinal cord injury, you know, maybe for someone with a very complete injury, it's um, for people who have, you know, a complete brachial plexus avulsion, for example, um, occasionally they do opt for arm amputation just because they have no movement or sensation of that limb and it actually can um, impair their, their function in that way and be injured because of that. Okay, so it is 1.30 Eastern. So um, that's the end of the scheduled time for, for this event. I wanna thank um, our two speakers, Dr. Collinger and Dr. Engel. Um, for those incredible talks and the um, answers to the questions. Uh, thank you to the audience uh, for attending and be on the lookout for our next BCI Society um, events um, posted on the website and on Twitter. Um, great, so we'll end there and thank you all for coming.